Good morning, all. Thank you for being here. Welcome to the annual general meeting of the BC Ferry Authority and the annual public meeting of the British Columbia Ferry Services Incorporated. My name is Bruce Williams. I'll be the moderator today. I'm the CEO of the Greater Victoria Chamber of Commerce. I would like to begin by acknowledging that I live and work in the unceded ancestral territory of the Lekwungen speaking peoples, including the territories of the Songhees and the Esquimalt peoples on whose territories we live, work, play, and where we currently stand. Um, for those who are joining us online through the Zoom feature this morning, we want to say a special good morning to you. We also want to make an acknowledgement of those who are living with and dealing with the situation with the wildfires across the province. Um, our hearts and thoughts are with you all. Uh, we understand that the most difficult times are likely over when it comes to the fires, but other challenges are on the way. So we very much sympathize with you. We're sending you our best thoughts and our best wishes for dealing with the circumstance. Uh, as I said, I'm with the Chamber of Commerce. We're the voice of business on the South Vancouver Island region. We're very pleased with the ongoing dialogue and interaction that we have with the BC Ferries team. There have been some struggles, which I'm sure will come up in our conversations today, but there's also been some advancements and some achievements. Uh, we are also the lead for the Vancouver Island Chamber Policy Alliance, a group including all island and Gulf Island Chambers of Commerce, and I'm also serving as a part of the BC Chamber Executives Network. So those groups meet with stakeholders to discuss solutions and opportunities for island-specific issues, and many of these communities are hugely dependent upon the services of BC Ferries. And just like we're seeing today at the AGM, uh, Ferries executives have always been open and available to us, and I would like to acknowledge that and thank them very much for that. Uh, as I mentioned, in addition to those of us gathered in the room here today, we are hosting the meeting on Zoom for stakeholders and interested parties to participate in the meeting from the comfort of their own home or office or car or on a ferry, wherever they might be. Uh, we're going to come to the question and answer period. There will be an opportunity for anyone who is watching the Zoom meeting to ask questions as well. We, of course, are here in the spirit of respectful dialogue and conversation. Uh, with the Zoom feature in place, bear in mind that we likely have families and children participating today. So for that reason, respectful dialogue is the mode for, for which we will operate today. Joining me today on stage are Lisa Stewart, who is the chair of the board of BC Ferry Authority. Joy McPhail, the chair of the board of British Columbia Ferry Services Incorporated. Nicholas Jimenez, the president and CEO of BC Ferries. And Jill Charland, the vice president and chief financial officer for BC Ferries. Very full agenda today, as I'm sure you can see. So a couple of housekeeping points. <clears throat> Please make sure that your cell phone is turned off and that ringer is down and the volume is adjusted. Everybody reaches for it right now. Thank you very much. Uh, after we conclude the presentations, we will move into the open dialogue, or if you will, the question and answer stage of the meeting. Would you please hold any questions you might have until that's completed? For that open dialogue portion, there is a microphone here in the room for those of, that are, those of you that are present. Um, and again, you can do it through the chat feature on Zoom. Uh, just let us know that you would like to speak. We would like to ask everyone, whether it's in the room or on Zoom, to state your name, your affiliation, and the line of questioning or the topic you would like to cover in the conversation. Um, comment forms are available as well in the table, uh, sorry, on the table in the lobby. If you'd rather write it down and submit it that way. And we will go through all of the meeting today, plus the open dialogue. And after that, some closing remarks will happen from Leisha. Uh, we need to review the caution regarding forward-looking statements that you see on the screen right there. Can we all just read that loud together or not? Uh, it's difficult to read that. There are copies of that available for you in the lobby. Um, I just need to just tell you why that's, why that's relevant. As part of the meeting today, statements may be made related to future events or the future performances of BC Ferries. These forward-looking statements are made as of today's date. They are based on management's current expectation and assumptions, and if these expectations or assumptions change or are incorrect, then the actual results could differ. Please bear that in mind, and thank you very much. And without further ado, I now welcome the chair, <coughs> excuse me, the chair of the Board of BC Ferry Authority, Alicia Stewart, to come up. Alicia. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, and welcome. Welcome to the annual general meeting of the BC Ferry Authority and the annual public meeting of the BC Ferry Services for the fiscal year ending March 31st. My name is Leisha Stewart, and I am the chair of the BC Ferry Authority Board. I look at today's meeting as an opportunity to reflect both on the successes and the challenges of the past year, and a look forward to what the future holds for BC Ferries. Uh, 
Uh, to begin with, a little, a little housekeeping. I uh, uh, am responsible to table the annual Ferry Authority report that outlines what our board has been doing in our efforts to strengthen public interest initiatives. It also includes the audited financial statements for the year end, March 31st, and it is available here in the room today and online for those of you who are joining us over Zoom. Uh, following my remarks, I'll invite Joy McPhail, Chair of the Board of BC Ferries, to table the remaining documents during her presentation. So what do we do at the Ferry Authority? Our role is to oversee the strategic direction of ferry services and ensure that the public interest is front and centre for our ferry services. The Authority Board is focused on any and all ways that maintain reliable, affordable ferry services that are so vital to our coastal economy and to the residents of BC. And to do that, we're working very collaboratively uh, to prepare the system, not only for today, but also for the future. Part of that collaboration has included work uh, with the province of BC, who play a vital role uh, as, the as the majority, but non-voting shareholder. Uh, the recent $500 million contribution to keep ferry fares affordable uh, is the single largest infusion of dollars into BC ferries in decades. And it is a testament of what we can achieve when we all work together as partners in our collective efforts to keep communities connected. Uh, a little bit of history. The Ferry Authority was established by Act by the provincial government back in 2003 under the Coastal Ferry Act. Um, and our job under, under the Act has really three main pillars. Um, as I said earlier, we oversee the strategic direction of BC Ferries in support of the public interest. We appoint a Ferry Services Board that shares a commitment to a people-focused outcome and we ensure that executive compensation is fair and equitable to the public. So I'm going to start with our mandate uh, on overseeing the strategic direction of ferry services in support of the public interest. We, of course, recognize the current operational and service challenges, and I have to say we're grateful for everyone in the ferries organization who keep the service going. And uh, while those immediate challenges require all of our collective efforts, we've also got to keep a focus on and our attention on shaping and defining the long-term direction for coastal ferry services. We recognize that we simply cannot focus on today without keeping an eye on the future. It's more critical than ever that we work in partnership with the services board, with management, with the province to address the complexities of the coastal ferry services. I should say the commissioner as well. Uh, we all have a role to play. Um, so this past year, the authority really did just that. And together with the services board, we put together a special project team to help us plan for the future. Because decisions on capital expenditures and other emphasis, service design, etc., really needs to consider very carefully the trends that are driving society in many directions, but also that are driving our customers' behaviours. It's obvious we would need, we need to improve and integrate other transit modes uh, at our connection points wherever possible. And we need to prepare for and enhance the inevitable growth in passengers who walk on or who have other mobility needs. And all this is happening at the same time as we've got rapid growth in coastal communities. Um, and they play a vital and important role in BC's economy. Uh, about three quarters of British Columbians live somewhere um, on the coast. And we are connected by services, by resources, uh, by how we work. Uh, and it is, um, in addition to a way to move between wonderful places for tourist reasons, we are a coastal economy and we have to think about it in terms of the economic uh, factors affecting the province. So if we're going to meet all those challenges, we need to develop a set of goals and targets that we can work towards with both our strategies and our actions. So over the next five, nine months, it's a, and it's a tight timeline time for what we've set as objectives, 
we're going to work together to bring a public interest and people-centered focus and collaborate on a new longer-term strategy to reflect the values and the interests of ferry users, ferry dependent uh, and First Nations communities, employees, and to try and be more responsive to regional and provincial policy directions. So I invite you to stay tuned. Uh, we'll be out uh, in the public realm coming this fall and there'll be an opportunity for uh, the public to get involved in this, uh, in this review. Let me address um, our mandate to appoint ferry service board members. In June 2022, we appointed a strong and dynamic group of new directors at ferry services. And I know because we, we know them all, they share a real desire for people-centered outcomes. And this new board elected Joy McPhail as their chair. And uh, early this year, they, the new board selected a new CEO, Nicholas Jimenez, who you will meet later in today's agenda, right over there. I know that each of us is committed uh, to collaborating and getting it right uh, for the sake of ferry dependent communities, customers, and the thousands of men and women who work at BC Ferry Services. Finally, our mandate in public interest also means ensuring compensation plans for directors uh, of both authorities meet public expectations. Uh, and so uh, last year, we, with a renewed Ferry Services Board, um, the authority worked collaboratively to align an executive compensation plan with the Greater BC Public Service. And that new plan sets upper limits for executive-based salaries, establishes the guidelines and methodologies that uh, the, the CEO and the chair use for establishing compensation, and it applies to all executive recruits um, uh, within uh, the executive ranks of, of ferries. We, we think the authority has established and restored fairness in what is often a contentious area, executive compensation, that meets public ex expectation while maintaining the ability to attract top talent to lead this very important organization. So uh, our other legislative accountabilities is the approval of the Ferry Services Annual Financial Statement, uh, and this report uh, uh, also discloses executive compensation, and it's tabled here today. And let me just take a moment to introduce um, our own authority board. <coughs> it is made up of nine people. Um, uh, the, the province does not have a majority uh, on the board of, of directors. Uh, four directors of the nine are nominated by regional districts in four distinct coastal communities. One member is nominated by the BC Ferry and Marine Workers Union, and four are appointed by the province of British Columbia. All active board members are here today, and so I'd like to ask each of them to stand as I introduce them. First, the regional representatives. Gary Coons, nominated by the Northern Coastal and North Island Appointment Area. Marlene Kalawowski, nominated by the Southern Vancouver Island Appointment Area. Mark Tremblay, nominated by the Central Vancouver Island and Northern uh, Georgia Strait Appointment Area. And we do have an appointment for the Southern uh, Mainland and uh, Sunshine Coast and Squamish Nation um, Area, which is defined by the Act. And their um, nominees are being interviewed at the beginning of September. So we have one more board member to be uh, to fill out our nine. The authority's uh, appointment appointee for organized labor is Andy Ross. Andy, I saw you there. Thank you. And finally, uh, our appointees from the province are Jessica Bowering, uh, David Levy, who is also the vice chair of the BC Ferry Authority, and Peter Lanton, and of course myself. Um, I, I am elected as chair by the board. I'm not appointed as chair by the province. That's not their purview. The board elects the chair. Uh, and every year that position is either renewed or you're not. <laughs> uh, so in addition to our two director's appointments that ended in March, I just wanted to thank uh, both of them for their service. Wynne Powell, who served as vice chair and was on the board for two full terms from the province, and Wayne Rowe, and thank them very much for the service that they provided. So with that, I will now ask Joy McPhail, chair of the board of directors of Very Services, to provide her report. Thank you. Thank you very kindly, Leisha. Those are excellent opening remarks. Um, 
and I thank everybody who's uh, joined us here today and uh, are listening online as well from far and wide. I too have some business to take care of in my role as chair, and then I would like to make uh, uh, a few comments uh, on behalf of the company, uh, about our company on behalf of the board. So um, as uh, Alicia said, I have ta a pleasure to table uh, three documents. One is our annual report. Uh, it's uh, comprised of our management's discussion and analysis of the financial uh, condition and our financial performance as outlined in our audited financial statements for the fiscal year ended March 31st, 2023. And that's part of, that, part of that document as well. And then we also have the performance and sustainability report, which includes the business plan for the current fiscal year and I have also uh, tabled uh, there as well the annual report of the BC Ferries uh, Services, Inc. Uh, to the British Columbia Ferries Commissioner uh, pursuant to Section 66 of the Coastal Ferry Act for the fiscal year ended March 31st, uh, 2023. And all of those documents are available out in the hallway uh, as well. They make for excellent reading on a Thursday. Um, so at this time, I'd like to recognize our directors as well, uh, who have joined the B BC Ferry Authority over the course of the last couple of days in uh, much um, work together. Uh, just wave your hand, Dennis Blatchford, or you could stand, yeah, no, kidding, do both. Uh, Harold Calla, Harold over there. Uh, Eric Denhoff, our vice chair, could not make it today, uh, sends his regrets. Uh, Kathy McClay, Kathy's there, Shona Moore. Shona, uh, there, okay, great. Uh, and uh, Sarah Morgan Sylvester, and Tamim Rad. Uh, so, oh, oh, I'm sorry, Charlene Hiller. <gasps> yes, you were there, there, you were there, that's my fault. I'm sorry. Um, so, I will just say that, uh, open up by saying this has been um, an, a challenging, and exciting time at BC Ferries, and we appreciate your interest and input as we set the vision and direction uh, of this vital public service. As you all know, we're rapidly approaching the end of a peak summer season. Uh, I know many of you arrived here uh, on our ferry service, and while there have been some service challenges, we acknowledge the real so story, though, is the surge in the demand for ferry service. In the last fiscal year, BC Ferries carried more than 9 million vehicles, which is an all-time record. And I think that can be attributed to a number of factors, including a pent-up desire for travel. We see that across the world. Our growing population um, and the changing employment patterns of British Columbians. More than 1 million people arrived in British Columbia, from, emigrated to British Columbia, um, uh, to Canada, I'm sorry, to Canada in, uh, uh, in 2022, and many of those arrived in British Columbia. Uh, regardless, this is the kind of growth that uh, really emphasizes the need to strategically plan the future of this ferry system to ensure its long-term uh, sustainability, and Leisha addressed that uh, very well. Um, of course, our focus is on safety, 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 reliability, and that uh, dependability uh, is at our forefront, and our commitment to those remains set steadfast. But we must also renew the fleet. There's been much discussion about that. We need to reinvest in terminals and reduce our carbon footprint. And we must do all of those while maintaining affordability. To that end, we are very grateful to the British Columbia government for the announcement of $500 million in new funding aimed at keeping affordable affairs affordable um, in the coming years. Now, this uh, kind of strategic plan isn't easy, especially when there are so many variables. Globalization is increasing uh, all costs. The labor shortage continues and shifting work patterns continue to evolve. But with hard work, good data, and plenty of consultation, we can develop reliable forecasts which will allow us to deliver quality ferry service to coastal British Columbia for generations to come. 
As we have envisioned the future of ferry service, as Leisha said, we want to hear the voices of individual passengers, coastal and ind indigenous communities, employees, and government partners. So you can help us set the course for the future. In a moment, we're going to be hearing from uh, more specifics from our new president and CEO. But before he joins us, I want to acknowledge uh, someone who has played uh, a very important role in this company. Last year, you will remember, um, not long before this meeting, Jill Charlin stepped up and took over as the interim president and CEO, helping guide us through some pretty turbulent waters. So on behalf of the Board of Directors, Jill, I want to thank you sincerely for your service and commitment uh, to making this a better company. Um, now I want to ask Nicholas Jimenez to join us. Uh, Nicholas was appointed President and CEO earlier this year. He is a change leader, a strategic thinker, and someone who is focused dead on on customer experience. And the board is thrilled that he is now at the helm of BC Ferries. Over to you, Nicholas. Um, well, uh, uh, thank you for everyone joining today. There's uh, 220 people uh, who are joining as well online, which I don't know if that's a record, but to me, that seems like a lot of people. Um, so this is great, and we're, we're, we're grateful for your interest today. Um, and I want to thank Joy and Leisha, uh, but really all the board members. I mean, these, these roles are not easy roles, and it consumes a large part of people's lives, and it's a choice they make. And so I want to thank them, all of them, for coming to be with us and help us plow through some very challenging times uh, and difficult issues. We couldn't really do this without uh, both boards and all of their passion for the system. Um, so it's been a very quiet five months for me. Um, not much has happened. Joy was very clear when I joined that there wouldn't be a lot of media. Um, <laughs> and it would be very low key, and I'd just be able to focus on the team and internal, and she's delivered, so I wanna say thank you very much for that, Joy. It's been great. Um, but today is an opportunity for us to talk uh, a little bit about the past, and then just provide a very brief glimpse into the future as well, and I think we need to do it honestly. Uh, you know, there's a lot of public conversation about the challenges that this company faces. They're well discussed, well covered. Thank you, Rob, thank you, Richard. Uh, and others, um, but we don't often get a chance to talk about the things that we've succeeded. And Joy mentioned the performance and sustainability report. Um, it's 51 pages, and I think it's actually a great reading, not just for Thursday, but every day. Um, there's a lot in here that celebrates uh, the 5,100 or more people uh, who make the system work each and every day, so we need to pay attention to that. Um, so uh, I'm gonna kind of dive right in and take a look a little bit about where we were last year. Uh, and remembering, too, that our purpose is to connect British Columbians to the people and places important in their lives. And that is no small thing. And that is something that I actually think we do pretty well. Um, so there's been a lot of conversation this summer about the system capacity, especially with the coastal celebration and more recently the coastal renaissance having issues. But if we step back from that, and Joy kind of alluded to this, we moved, she mentioned, 9.4 million vehicles, 21.6 million people. So for context, that's more people that pass through YVR. And YVR is the country's second largest airport. Um, this is a, is a big system. It's one of the largest in the world, and I think people forget that sometimes. We had more sailings uh, this past year, 176,000 sailings, which equates to about 500 per day. Uh, that's 7,600 more than what is in the Coastal Ferry Services contract. And it doesn't make the news, but uh, eight and a half out of 10 of those sailings go out on time. Uh, more than that, 98.5% go according to the plan. And we can talk a little bit about the impact on communities when those things aren't true and they're very real. Um, but very often, we are delivering and achieving what the system needs uh, and is, is set up to do. Um, one of the things that I think is also important to put into context, and Joy also mentioned this, is not only removing more people, but there's 
an increasing demand for the services. So Joy mentioned uh, the number of people coming into the country. Well, the number of people who came into the province last year was the highest growth rate in the last 50 years. We haven't seen growth rate 3.1% like we have since 1974. Uh, and that's context for the demands on the system. And one of the things we did last year was to respond to that demand. Uh, we increased capacity. We welcomed the Salish, Harris, uh, the Salish Heron, which provides service between the southern Gulf Islands. We introduced two ship service between Nanaimo and Gabriel Island and between Campbell River and Quadra Island. Uh, these are good things. Expanding service helps reduce wait times uh, and it responds to community needs. Now, obviously, there are community demands and needs that we're not always able to meet, at least not in the moment, but we certainly have plans for that. We'll talk a little bit about that in, in a second. Um, another thing that I think we need to put into context is the fact that in as much as we talk about ships and terminals, it's a people business. Uh, we could not achieve any of the levels of service that we provide without people. We're over 5,000 people strong, uh, and they every day deliver safe, which is critical, uh, reliable transportation, and they do it 365 days a year. And in many cases, they're doing it 24 hours a day. We have teams on our ships literally every single minute of, this, uh, of, the, of the day, every single day of the year, and that's something that I think people uh, forget sometimes. Um, so, in 2022, we recognized that there were challenges in the system. Our resilience, we've talked a lot about this publicly, uh, was being put to the test. And we recognized that we needed a different approach in terms of how we began to look at hiring. And so what did we do? Well, we did a number of things to build a more people-centric approach to the company. A couple of things. Uh, we eliminated a seasonal job category, and that would uh, allow people to move into a casual class of, of labor, which would allow us to guarantee people hours. And that's critical if you want to keep people for your demand, uh, your peak demand summer season. We enhanced the employee referral program. Again, another significant step forward in order to make us an employer of choice. Uh, we all know that when you hire people, you know, you generally speaking, the statistics show you have a higher retention rate and you get better performance. Uh, we made record invest investments in training and development, which is absolutely critical for a business that relies on uh, people meeting classification requirements for certain roles. Uh, we increased the allowances for those with special and high demand skills, uh, and particularly for those who work overnight. So a number of these things were the focus of the team, and I, I can't take credit for this, but the team should get credit for putting in place these measures in order to set us up for more success this summer when it came to crewing. And we've seen that pay itself out. Uh, and certainly uh, that's what's being revealed in our Q1 results right now. So another thing we need to talk about is relationships. Um, I think it's true that this company uh, recognized recently uh, within the last year or two that it had work to do. Uh, I spent some critical time uh, with the ferry advisory committees, many of whom are here, the chairs, uh, in the last two, three days talking about uh, where this company needs to improve, uh, both at a systemic level, but also to in a relationship sense. Uh, and I value the conversations we've had. Many important issues were raised. Some systemic, like crewing and housing, um, system capacity, uh, and others uh, very specific to communities, uh, sailings, communication, et cetera. Uh, these are all important conversations that I think we uh, need to have, are having, and, and will continue to have. So I want to thank everyone in the room from the Ferry Advisory Committees who have spent three days with us uh, talking through very complicated sets of issues. The other thing I think we need to recognize is that we spent a lot of time improving and building relationships with Indigenous communities up and down the coast. And I think uh, Brian Anderson and his team uh, get credit for doing a lot of this very important work. But it's a shift for this company. And I would say, and Brian would say, um, that this is the beginning of new partnerships uh, and a new way of thinking about our asset intensive and in some cases land and water intensive business where we need different conversations and different relationships uh, with indigenous communities. Uh, we established important protocol agreements in this last year uh, with the Sunamuk and with the Sartlet First Nations. Uh, we increased engagement with a number of coastal First Nations, and we're looking at a, at a number of very complicated terminal initiatives that intersect land use, fishing, 
marine aquaculture interests. So that work is going to continue, but I'm very proud uh, that the team is doing that work today. And it's very unfortunate that the incident that happened recently, you will have seen in the news, uh, on Hornby Island, this is absolutely not a reflection of this company, uh, not a reflection of the values that we place in these relationships, and we are deeply disappointed and disturbed it happened and are taking measures to make sure it never happens again. So I wanted to make sure we called that out. Um, so where are we at as a business? We've been very public about this. <coughs> uh, <coughs> very public in the sense that we, you know, we need to talk about the fact that there are some systemic issues facing not just BC ferries, but ferry operators in North America and right around the world. Uh, but there's also issues that we've acknowledged that we have uh, a part in. Things we talked earlier about crewing, where our response to the changing demographics in our workplace and to some of the environmental challenges we have in terms of people and labor markets, we were slow to respond. Um, so if I think about where this business sits today, we've talked about the labor shortage, it continues. Uh, we've talked about the worldwide shortage of trained mariners, uh, an issue for all of those operating in this industry. We know that fuel prices are putting incredible pressures on a business like ours where we consume um, massive quantities of fuel each and every year, more than 150, 200 million. Uh, we face inflationary pressures in almost every part of our business. Um, and our suppliers are struggling. We've, we've actually talked about this. And as much as we have challenges attracting talent, they do too. And we've seen some of this. Uh, our coastal celebration refit was delayed in part because our shipyard partner had its own challenges with highly technical and specialized skill sets. Our fleet and terminals are aging. We know this. Again, we've chatted uh, with our ferry advisory uh, committee partners uh, extensively about this because they feel and see it each and every day. And all of this is happening at a time when travel demand is at an all-time high, and that's putting a significant strain on our capacity to deliver. So rather than just lay the problems out, we're trying and acting on all of these issues today. What we know is as much as we can make progress in the near term, many of these issues are systemic and many will take uh, time to fully resolve. But the, the plan is in place, the boards are aligned, uh, government is supportive, and we are moving forward. So we're a thing, <coughs> talk a little bit about setting the vision. Joy and Lisa both talked about an important process. I'll say more about that in a second. Uh, we're focusing on our financial sustainability. Uh, we are putting in place plans to renew our physical assets. We are building a more environmentally sustainable program, and we are investing in our people to build the, the, the resilience the business needs in order to deliver the system that people expect. Um, uh, on affordability, uh, Joy called this out, uh, that the government did produce um, uh, or demonstrate an active commitment, uh, both during COVID in the Safe Start funding, but also recently for our performance term six, $500 million contribution in order to keep uh, fares affordable. But it exposes some very real issues around long-term, stable, and secure funding. And that conversation is one that our boards will have. And this is central to the initiative that we're actually undertaking with the authority, with our board, and with government. And that's to develop a long-term vision for the ferry system. And it, as we envision ferry system for the next generation, we know that we're faced with strategic questions, where we sail, how often we sail, the types of fuel we consume, our environmental footprint, uh, and our fiscal security. How will people travel in the future? Do we need as much desk space for single occupancy vehicles? How will BC ferries reduce its carbon intensity, all while accommodating the increased number of people who want to walk on and cycle and transit to get to our terminals? Uh, now, these are just a few of the future-focused questions that we're considering. Now, we don't all have all the answers right now, and we will be engaging British Columbians to help us uh, take part in this conversation. I'm, we are extremely excited. The board met yesterday for two hours in order to talk through the initiation of this process. Consultations will occur in the fall and through the early winter. Uh, and by sometime in this late spring next year, we will emerge with not a vision for what the system needs to be, uh, but a plan for how we're going to get there in terms of the investments that we need to make today. Um, we've advanced, as you know, uh, a $5.2 billion capital plan. Uh, and that capital plan will be in 
informed in part by the visioning process that we will take, but also by the very real needs of the business that we have today. And the investments that we will make, well, they're going to be prudent, uh, but they will reflect the needs of the business. Uh, we know that we have uh, issues around capacity. We have, we're working and have submitted uh, business cases for our board and regulator uh, to review and approve new major vessel replacement. Our ships are aging. We know that. We see that. We feel that. The investments and the plans are in, uh, in place in order to begin the long journey in order to bring uh, a new and modern uh, vessel into the fleet. Um, when we think about our sustainability, I have to give credit to the company. In 2022, last year, we published a clean futures plan, uh, and we updated our roadmap to a cleaner future. Uh, we are a business that is not just uh, acid intensive, it is carbon intensive. 98% uh, of our GHG impact comes from the fuel we use in our vessels. Uh, we have a plan in place that to reduce uh, emissions by 27% uh, below our 2,000 levels by 2030. Uh, we are looking at renewables. We are looking at electrification. We are looking at operational efficiencies and fleet modernization. All of that is going to play a role in us achieving our bargain. And our environmental initiatives, well, they're not just around the footprint uh, issue around GHD, also to do things like underwater radiated noise. And that can affect the southern resident orca population. So with things like an improved design uh, and alternative propellers, our new vessels, well, they're quieter than any others that we've ever had in the fleet. And every new vessel, I can guarantee you, will be quieter, quieter than the last. And that is a commitment that we are making uh, in this business because we know, uh, again, as, as users of coastal waterways, we have a responsibility in more ways uh, than just uh, the engine and the fuel that we use. Um, the last is around our people. And I spent a time talking about the things that we've done. Uh, we've got more work to do here. Uh, and I'm very proud of the work that the team has done in order to progress for 2023, uh, accruing uh, investments uh, in, uh, in, in uh, training and certifications. Uh, but we have to revisit this model for crewing and staffing, one that fits the business as we find it today. Uh, and we have a new leader in place, Cameron Bryan, uh, who has joined us from uh, the very easy experiences that he had at Fraser Health uh, in the similar role. Uh, he's going to bring the discipline and the experience uh, there to really help us address the challenges that we have. We have to look at compensation and benefits. We're working right now with the union. We're in the middle of negotiations uh, and very keen to see that process play out so that we can deliver uh, to our people. We're looking at a more systematic examination of how we staff the business and in particular training and career development. We've heard it clearly from people today very difficult to become a full-time employee at ferries. It takes many years, uh, and then it takes a lot of training. Training is expensive, and it takes time. We need to rethink how that model works for everybody. Finally, we need to improve uh, the way we listen uh, and the way we think about leadership, and those are things that Cameron and the rest of the executive team will be making investments in. Okay, uh, I'm going to leave it there, uh, and I'm going to turn it over to Jill, who is going to describe a little bit more detail uh, in the many documents that Joy has tabled right beside me. So, Jill, very much looking forward to hearing you lay out the financials for the year. Thank you for coming, and I look forward to the questions. Put it down much lower, like Joy. <laughs> um, good morning, everybody. I'm Jill Shoreland, and I'm going to present the really exciting financial performance for fiscal year um, 2023. Um, so firstly, and you've heard about the uh, return of passenger traffic, um, I just want to show you a bit of the history going back to 1990. As this chart passenger traffic shows, while we've had fluctuations in passenger traffic over the years, sometimes as much as 10%, you can see these were historically significant until COVID hit. Nothing compares to that dramatic decline we saw in fiscal 21. In fiscal 22, the recovery began and passenger traffic increased to almost 18 million and fiscal 23, it improved to 21.6 million, a 21% increase over last year. And we're now only 3% below our record level in 2019. Vehicle traffic, on the other hand, has rebounded significantly. And you heard it already, we had a record 9.4 million vehicles carried in fiscal 23, 
and that's half a million more than our previous record in fiscal 2019. Both the downturns and upturns in traffic bring their own set of challenges to the operations of ferry service, the customer experience, and our financial performance. The past few years has enabled the organization to emerge from the pandemic more agile and better able to adjust to shifts in traffic. While we're cautiously optimistic that traffic will continue to be strong, inflation, fuel prices, and rising interest rates may impact future travel volumes. In 2021, we launched our Fair Flexibility Initiative, which has been in operation now for the past two years. This program provides a variety of discounted fare choices, allowing customers with flexibility to travel at more affordable rates during off-peak times. This in turn helps balance the load across the system, enabling more people to travel at their desired times, while also reducing sailing weights and the number of vehicles overloaded. In fiscal 23, our routes between the Lower Mainland and Vancouver Island, when compared to our highest monthly vehicle totals prior to the launch of fare flexibility, we carried 4.3% more traffic, increased our cap capacity utilization on our ships from 74 to 79%, and reduce the number of customers experiencing sailing weights by 17%. To be able to carry more traffic with less congestion was all the more remarkable as due to our crewing challenges, we were unable to run as many sailings last year. Going forward, we'll continue to fine tune the system to enable our ships to maximize the amount of traffic they can carry so people can get to the places they want to go when they want to go. So here's our financial results for the year ended March 31st, 2023. I'll go over these separate line items in more detail in the next few slides. Our financial performance improved this year compared to the prior year, which had the impact of the pandemic and included safe restart operating funding of 102 million. We experienced the highest vehicle traffic, which meant we had higher revenues, but also higher expenses. What you can see here is a net loss of 1.8 million for fiscal 23 compared to earnings of 34 million the previous year. But when you consider that fiscal 23 had only 9.3 million of safe restart funding compared to 102 million, it's a significant improvement over the prior year. Without the safe restart funding, our net loss for the year ended March 31st would have been 11 million, million compared to a net loss of 68 million in the prior year, effectively a 57 million improvement. As you know, our financial performance ultimately impacts the, the ability to deliver the much needed capital plan to renew and refurbish our vessels, terminals, and other assets. Without the safe restart funding in fiscal 22 and fiscal 21, our losses would have been significant. In December 2020, as you all know, we received 308 million of funding as part of the provincial and federal government safe restart program. 280 million of this was to fund losses expected over the ferry system, of which 94 million was recognized in fiscal 22 and 186 million uh, in the big COVID year fiscal 21. That funding has now been fully allocated and there's nothing left remaining to support the system if another downturn occurs. The other two components of safe restart funding were to minimize fares, holding rates flat in fiscal 21 and to 2.3% the next three years, and, then, and to also maintain certain discretionary sailings over the next three years. There's only 10.4 million of that to cover initiatives this year. Once again, we're extremely grateful to the province for providing this much needed funding. Now I'll touch a little bit on revenue. Tariff revenue, which is our, cust our customers pay to travel on the ferries at 684 million was 112 million greater than the prior year, a 20% increase. This makes up about two thirds of our revenue and which is now back to pre-pandemic levels. Also from our customers are ancillary revenues, things like retail, catering, and parking. And if customers choose to purchase those items, the net earnings from those activities are used to reduce the pressure on fares. We experienced a significant 21 million increase compared to the prior year, resulting from the return of traffic and the removal of travel restrictions. The province of British Columbia provides an annual fee for specified service levels on most of our routes as well as for discounted fares for certain types of travel like seniors, students, medical. This amounted to 213 million this past year, a slight increase as there are more usage of these programs in fiscal 23. Safe restart funding of 9.3. And lastly, the government of Canada provides a subsidy of 33.2 million 
and this amount increases each year in perpetuity with the Vancouver Price uh, Index. So moving on to operating expenses, total operating expenses increased 124 million or 14% compared to the prior year. Wages, benefits and fuel are by far our largest expenses representing about 63%. Operations, the vessels and everything that runs the ferry service is our largest cost activity and it increased by 89 million from 558 to 647 million. The main reason for this increase was you know, somewhat related to increased service levels. You heard earlier about the additional two, uh, additional round trips on the miners, Nanaimo Gabriola, two ship service. As a result of these incremental round trips, there are increases in labor and fuel, which increased by about $50 million. But we also had significant fuel uh, price pressure, which contributed another $30 million in expenses. Maintenance, uh, 17.2 increased, 115. We have long-range maintenance plans for each of these assets which specify their scheduled maintenance and the year-over-year -year change reflects some unplanned uh, repairs and maintenance at our terminals, uh, but the cyclical, cyclical nature of our refit schedule. Administration went up 9.3 million to 47 million. This increase relates to labor and benefits costs as well as increase in consulting and software licensing. Um, some of the higher labor costs you heard earlier consist of investments in our people and culture department. Depreciation and amortization up 8 million to 181. And this reflects the additional service that was in, in full year for fiscal 23, the incremental four island class vessels and the Salish Heron. And net financing actually decreased by 4.7 million. And this is a result of the higher interest we're earning on our investments. With our vessel construction completed in fiscal 22, fiscal 23, we primarily upgraded our existing vessels, terminals and equipment. Capital expenditure has consequently actually decreased by 39.9 million to 131 million. Some notable highlights are we spent 41 million on major overhaul and inspections of components of hull, propulsion, and generators on nine vessels, 45 million used to maintain and refurbish terminal and marine structures, and 21 million on information and technology. So looking forward, we will continue to focus investments on safe, reliable, and efficient service. Investing in our greatest asset, our employees, will be critical in our plans going forward. The collective agreement provides for wage reopeners in years four and five, and these negotiations began in August with agreed to early wage increases effective October 2023. It's also necessary to renew and replace our ships, terminals, and IT systems in order to continue to deliver safe and reliable service. Over the next 14 years, there's a need to replace 13 vessels. Six of these are the large vessels on the major routes. And we'll continue to focus on ensuring that we have adequate net positive earnings, as these are necessary to renew the ships, refurbish and modernize our terminals, and all profits are reinvested in the ferry system. To build net earnings, we are focusing on initiatives that will drive efficiencies that we can keep fares low, building on the success of fare flexibility, transitioning to low cost, low carbon energy, expanding the products and services we offer and diversifying revenue streams and focusing on management of controllable costs. We filed our next performance term submission with the commissioner for the period April 24 to March 28 and received preliminary decision on price caps of 9.2% per year. The province announced 500 million in new funding, which we are very grateful for in order to keep annual fare increase below at or below 3%. The commissioner will consider this funding contribution in the final price cap determination expected at the end of September. As you've heard from all of us, the capital plan to support this, this system is significant in order to replace aging fleet on the major routes and to support traffic growth across the system. Ensuring we're selective about our investments and efficient with our spending is critical to keeping pressure on fares as manageable as possible. Thank you and that's the financial performance for fiscal 23. I am going to sit at the end of the table there to do the question and answer, guys. So can we activate the mics on the table? Thank you. Okay. So this is the time for questions and answers, the dialogue part of the program. And as we mentioned before, we're going to have you, if you're in the room, go to that microphone over there. 
What we're going to ask is that you uh, introduce yourself, state your name, your affiliation. If you're on Zoom, please state your location. Um, we're going to do about two minutes for the question, if possible, and then a follow-up after that. Uh, if we could, please just address the panel once so that everyone has an opportunity to speak. So we're going to alternate between uh, comments on Zoom and comments from in the room. And if you're doing this through the Zoom room and the chat room, which I can't actually find, but I'm going to find it shortly, uh, if you could uh, tell us what the topic is you'd like to address. So, would anyone in the room like to step to the microphone and ask a question? Sir, hi. Hello. We'll get uh, my name is Stephen Wehner. I'm with the Hornby Denman Island Advisory Committee, and we uh, got a, we, we looked to a report uh, uh, compiled by BC Ferries called the Bain Sound Connector Review, dated February 16, 2023. And it evaluates different options for improving the cable ferry on Route 21. Um, it is five pages, it has, it discusses five options, and it provides um, not much background of the analysis um, that, you know, supports the recommendations of the report. So, question for uh, Mr. Jimenez, <laughs> especially in, in, you know, I liked it when you, when you, at the beginning of your presentation, um, uh, alluded to, you know, looking at things honestly and, and openly. Um, if we could have a, you know, a transparent review of this Bain Sound Connector review. So that would either have a new, a new independent review or to uh, uh, pub publish or make available the, um, the background information. There's a, there's a consultant report that is re referred to in the report. And so if, if we could, you know, look at that to to understand the decisions that uh, BC ferries uh, will make for this for this cable ferry. Uh, <coughs> Are we on? This doesn't sound like it's on. We good? Okay. Um, well, the wonderful thing about being brand new is that I have not read every single report uh, in the company's history. Um, so. Uh, I can lean on Brian Anderson to give you a little bit more specifics in terms of that report, uh, the information that went into um, uh, pr uh, the recommendations. What I can tell you is that the ship has recently come out of its maintenance program and is running, uh, is running reliably and running well. That's in the current state. Uh, your question speaks a little bit more to, uh, to history. So Brian, for the historical context, why don't you uh, shed a little bit more light on that particular review and report. Great. We've got a lot of microphones being live. So <laughs> I'm worried about background, but is this, is this okay? Yeah, okay, great. Uh, and thank you for the question. Uh, and uh, uh, certainly as one of the sort of the organizers of that review, uh, and I, I think I've, I've bring, come to the FAC meeting and we've discussed this topic at, at quite a lot of length, so I'll just summarize it for, th for this meeting. Um, uh, we engaged a consultant to help us uh, to review our plans because as, as Jill and, and Nicholas mentioned, our performance term six plan, which, which really reflects a long-term approach to investments across all of the routes and all the systems, terminals, vessels, and others, included some significant investments in the Bain Sound Connector, which is the cable ferry that operates between Vancouver Island and, and Denman Island. And um, at the last year's AGM, I believe a consortium from Denman and Hornby uh, raised a number of concerns, and in response to those concerns, uh, we committed to undertake a review uh, before undertaking those investments. And, and that's what that review uh, did. Uh, it looked at a number of different options to satisfy service between those two routes. Here's the background that I was worried about, uh, feedback. Uh, a number of options were considered. I think what was clear from that review is replacing the Bain Sound Connector with a free running ferry of the size that is required to satisfy the predicted demand for that route is significantly more expensive in the long term than continuing on with the Bain Sound Connector. However, we're taking a cautious approach. We have deferred the investments in the Bain Sound Connector expansion and repowering. Instead, we have taken an approach to twin that vessel for the peak, uh, peak seasons when 
when traffic is at its highest, we've deployed a larger vessel to the route connecting Denman to Hornby, addressing two of the main pain points uh, on those routes. We are, we are watching to see how that will perform. It's the first season. We're seeing very strong results, uh, but we're going to continue to monitor that for the next few years before we make any further investments in the main town connector. Uh, small follow-up? Is there a follow-up? Yes, please. So, uh, you, you know, when you say you, you're new to BC Ferries, yeah, the, the, the Bain sound connector is not new to BC Ferries, and it hasn't worked well for years and years and years. And it, to me and, you know, to the, the, the community, it looks like BC Ferries is being very stubborn with this, with this Bain sound connector, and it, it really doesn't work well. No, thank you, sir. Uh, let's go thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, let's go to Zoom. Uh, Stanley Tromp, sir, good morning. Uh, we're going to unmute you and please feel free to ask your question and make your comment. signatures on a petition for this goal to present it to the legislature, but we so wish this would not be necessary. So providing such a rain and sunlight cover is caring, ethically right, cheap, simple, easy, and immensely popular. What else could one ask for? Will you commit today to solve this problem? Thank you. I'm going to assume that that's for me. Um, yeah, um, I'm going to say so, yeah. Uh, well, look, thanks for the question. Uh, in fact, the issue of uh, transit and ferry integration came up this morning. Uh, the Ferry Advisory Committee was one of the issues we talked about. Uh, and we talked about the fact that there, there is a working group now. There is a working group now uh, with uh, the three agencies, Transit, TransLink, and BC Ferries. Uh, so I would agree that there are definitely improvements that can be made. I know we in the summer have put up temporary uh, shelters uh, for sun and eventually rain in the fall uh, to address the issues that you're talking about. And I also know that we're looking at a different solution that's a little bit more robust for the fall, given that we're going to turn into the rainy season. So, so we hear your your concern, and it is something we are definitely working on, not just as BC Ferries, but with 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 our partners, uh, TransLink and Transit. Yes, thank you. But it is BC Ferries land, so it shouldn't be agencies passing it off to each other. It is uh, BC Ferries' responsibility. Is there a question there, sir, or is that just a comment? A comment. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, let's go back to in person in the room, please. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Karen Ross. I'm the fact chair for Hornby Denman. I bring greetings from our community, deep gratitude for the changes that were made this summer. Uh, our system has had significant relief with the twinning of the, uh, well, supplemental service for Route 21 and the larger capacity vessel on Route 22. Uh, our concerns are that this is a very temporary measure, it's a Band-Aid. Uh, Route 21, the service improvement is for two months out of 12 
and Route 22 six months out of 12. So we are uh, continuing to bring to the forefront that these vessels have been the same capacity for 40 years, in fact, less capacity than we had 40 years ago in 1983 when we had 300 people on Denman and about the same on Hornby. We now have 1,200 people. BC Parks just invested $11.2 million expanding the park, 150 uh, site campsite. Uh, we believe that we have opened the doors of our islands to the people of the province of British Columbia and to the detriment of the residents that live there and have ever deteriorating service and that it has not been adequately addressed. My question is, it actually was for the commissioner, but she's not at the table, so I guess, Mr. Jimenez, it's for you. Can we have a formal commitment to continue at least the service improvements that were provided this summer? Demand and delivery on our routes have for years exceeded the minimums reflected in the ferry services contract. Will the capacity provided this summer on routes 21 and 22 at a minimum be reflected in ferry service contracts moving forward? Um, I was getting a, a nod from Jill and a nod from Brian. Uh, I mean, Brian talked about the fact that it has been successful this summer, that we are going to evaluate it this summer, but it is, in fact, in our PT6 uh, to do as you've described. So uh, I want to prejudge the, the conclusion of the review. Brian, I don't know if you want to say anything more in terms of timing and scope, but certainly uh, we are supportive of what you're saying. And it's, it's, it's established in, PT, in the filing that we made for performance term six. I, I, and I'm happy to expand because I know what Karen is asking is, will that continue uh, in the foreseeable future? And, uh, and the answer is yes. So in our, in our plans for this year, of course, the, the twinning, as I call it, the supplemental, uh, and the larger vessel is, is going to continue through to the end of the peak season. That is in the plan and in the contract with the province for next year uh, and becomes sort of the normal practice and expectation subject to any renegotiations or any, any changes that may come as a result of what we're seeing in terms of its success. So uh, the, the, the answer to your question is yes. Uh, no, I don't think the answer to my question is yes. I think that the, uh, the question is that the service enhancement is for two out of 12 months. We're looking for a year-round uh, approach to service to the islands. Uh, yes, it is in PT6 for July and August, those similar improvements to this summer. We do not have vessel replacements in the performance term proposals until 2034. And 2034 for the worst performing routes in the minor route fleet is not sufficient. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's go back to Zoom and we will move forward to uh, Travis, I believe, Kelsa. Travis, good morning. Just a couple of comments and a couple of questions. Um, with regards to the booking service for the Central Coast, um, I wonder if there's been any, any more improvements, proposed improvements to that system. Um, again, this is just to raise the concern for the local uh, travelers who utilize the service quite often. Um, tended, they tend to put us on a waiting list and we arrive to the terminal and there's an empty terminal. Uh, that just being one question, you don't have need to answer it now. You guys, um, I'm sure it'll take some research to uh, figure that out. Um, the, the other thing that I've, I've been concerned about is this discharge from the vessels into McLaughlin Bay. Um, I, from my understanding, there was a, um, I don't know if it's a law passed or, or some kind of regulation that, um, that vessels are only to discharge or to be pumped out at the pump stations in Port Hardy and in Prince Rupert. I've witnessed um, this charge into McLaughlin Bay several times. Um, it's quite concerning to me considering um, if you're, I, I don't, you're probably not aware of this, but people do um, spiritual baths 
at the mouth of the creek here, uh, children will swim next to the fish plant um, right into these waters and um, the vessels are discharging right into the bay here. Um, so yeah, just a couple of questions and a couple of concerns brought up by a, a Central Coast member. I'm on a regional district as well. I was previously the, um, the community rep on the advisory board uh, quite some time ago and uh, seem to still be asked to uh, make some comments and, and share some concerns for the regional district and members of the Health Sick Nation in Bella Bella. Thank you. Um, sure. <clears throat> Uh, I'm going to take both of those questions away. Uh, on the booking service, I think we'll need to investigate that a little bit more so we understand your concerns. I know we'll have your contact information so we can follow up directly. Uh, and on the discharge in McLaughlin Bay, that's not new information for me. So again, that's information that we'll take away uh, and, and, and evaluate immediately uh, to understand uh, more about what you're saying. So we, we may actually follow up with you directly again for further details. So thank you for raising both. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm Kim Barton Bridges from the Northern Sunshine Coast Ferry Advisory Committee. Um, when I was uh, thinking about speaking to you before I came up here, I was really grumpy and I had a lot of really grumpy things to say. Um, I, I have to say thank you to all the parties involved in bringing all of our Ferry Advisory Committee chairs here. Um, I think we've had some really good conversations over the last few days. Um, and I just, there's just two, a couple of things that stand out. I, I think we all know that um, our ferry system isn't sustainable the way it is, and I'm very cautiously optimistic about the visioning process that will happen this fall. And I say cautiously because there was a visioning exercise that was initiated by the government um, a number of years ago, and I, I myself traveled to the island to participate in that gave my feedback and as I as did a lot of people over it was a, it was done over the course of quite a period of time and then we didn't hear anything about it so I just want to hold you accountable to, and the boards to you know um, we we really we're all I, I I want to get people involved in that I'm um, I will commit to getting our community out there but I want you to commit to actually using that information and coming back to us with, um, you know, a report and an outcome. And also um, the communication, we've talked about that, communication, communication, communication. And I'm really impressed that 223 people are on Zoom when the service notice about this went out 24 hours ago. So those are the sorts of things I would like to see improve. I mean, you, let's, you know, involve our communities and the people who are traveling all the time, but let's let them know how to be involved in a timely manner and make that available to them. So it's a thank you and thank you, and I know there are some positive things that have happened over the last few years, but just those little concerns that are in the back of my mind, so. Uh, thank you. Uh, let's go back to Zoom and uh, Leon Lebrun. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, my name is Daniel Lebrun. I'm, uh, I, I'm a resident of Coquitlam. I am a board member of Trails BC, a host of, of cycling meetups and serving a number of cycling groups on the lower mainland and in the Fraser Valley. I would like to bring to your attention how un unwelcoming it is for pedestrians and cyclists in particular when approaching and exiting the Swasson uh, Ferry Terminal along its lengthy causeway. The, the provision of a multi-use pathway on the south side of the causeway is long overdue. Uh, what exists presently is truly lamentable. I am certain that tourists and our residents must wonder how it is that this accommodation is being overlooked in this era of encouraging active transportation. It needs to be part of our infrastructure in an effort to connect with existing and future trail and cycle networks that lead to and from the Lower Mainland and the Fraser Valley. 
The ferry system is an obvious host that, Greece, that greets our visitors and us who visit and commute between Vancouver Island and the mainland. As it stands, why is it that this sector of our transportation users feels so uninvited? The causeway is within the jurisdiction and responsibility of BC Ferries. The cycle paths are narrow and unlit for most of its length, resulting in a very poor gateway arrival experience for tourists and residents alike. Millions have recently been budgeted for ferries and supporting infrastructure elsewhere. Millions would not be uh, required for active transportation friendly access along the causeway to the Twasser terminal. Also, because the approach bisects the Twasser First Nation Reserve, there appeared to be little recognition that it does so. On the causeway and where the causeway meets the mainland park lay on foot, but nobody on bike, on a, on a coach or in car, has any sense of arriving or leaving past the Tsuasan First Nation. And at this time, the Great Blue Heron Way dike top trail on the TFN land north of the causeway has no safe connection to the causeway. It is terminated by the causeway. Please invite them to offer ways that make them feel at least included in some way to correct these issues. As a member of the cycling community in particular, I am pleading that this be taken as a priority item for you. Uh, thank you for giving me the, the time uh, on behalf of the cycling community to, mm -hmm. uh, to being heard. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Duly noted. Anybody want to comment on that? I mean, I would just say that's very well expressed, uh, and I was chatting with Jill, our CFO, to uh, see if she's aware of a, a specific capital project in the capital plan. I am not, but that is definitely something we will take back, and I commit as well to taking it back to the, uh, to the form that we have with TransLink uh, and Transit, because I think you spoke specifically about the causeway, but you also talked about the broader network. Uh, on the approach, so I think I think it's a it's a great question and a great issue and one that we'll we'll definitely take away. Thank you very much. Hi, good morning. Good morning. My name is Diana Mumford, and I'm here representing the Southern Sunshine Coast Ferry Advisory Committee. During last year's AGM, BC Ferries identified the Sunshine Coast, which is Route Three from Langdale to Horseshoe Bay as one of the hot spots of service concerns within the BC Ferry system. Southern Sunshine Coast speakers who were in attendance in person or linked uh, remotely and figured predominantly in the call for questions highlighted the many issues that confront Route 3 users on any given day. The recent BC Ferries fiscal uh, 2023 annual report to the commissioners reiterated these issues when it was reported an on-time performance for Route 3 is just 73.6% and almost one-third of our sailings are overloaded. It is now a full year later and I can only assume that the reference by BC Ferries to hotspot pertained to the weather and not Route 3 service that continues to fall far short of the expectation and need for our communities. Nothing has changed. Coast residents were informed by BC Ferries that there would be more service in the shoulder season, but that service never materialized. Furthermore, we are told that a second ship will, will not be sailing our route until 2030. In 2017, residents were also assured of redevelopment and improvements of the Langdale Terminal, yet it has now mysteriously disappeared off all capital plans with no explanation to the communities. This year, concerns persist about the health and safety of our residents who are trying to travel home through Horseshoe Bay. Often, they are stuck above the toll booth in the summer heat for hours with just four Jiffy Johns at the top of a steep incline, no water and no shade. If that parking area fills, BC Ferries then tells people 
without reservations to come back later. Imagine if this technique were used on busy highways to clear traffic. I doubt that it would be tolerated, yet it is inflicted on coast ferry users, even though those ferries are our road. My questions are, when will we receive firm and realizable assurances that on-time performance will be improved? When will the ongoing issues with overloads be addressed? And when will residents of the Southern Sunshine Coast be reassured that their health and safety is of concern, as we assume it is for all ferry users, and that steps will be taken immediately to relieve the intolerable conditions above the Horseshoe Bay Terminal by moving traffic into the terminal lot as quickly as possible, and that washrooms and water will be provided above the toll booth for those that are still waiting. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Um, there's a, a number of, there's three questions in there. Brian, I'm gonna get you to take the first two, well, you can take all three, but I can certainly comment on the third one. Uh, there's a level of specificity I think your planning team um, is probably able to bring specific insights. Happy to do so. Um, thanks. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll address the questions in order, it, but they're very interconnected. And I, and I think if you go back to the beginning of the presentation, there's pressures across the system. Uh, and there's growing populations, there's growing demands, there's changing travel patterns, and they're manifesting in, in a number of ways. Uh, whether that is uh, higher travel at peak times, higher travel at what were traditionally off-peak times. Uh, Jill mentioned that we were able to achieve record volumes of vehicle travel uh, despite fewer sailings, uh, highest in the history of BC Trans or of BC Ferries. So, so it's reflective of the fact that there's ongoing pressures. Um, so, to your questions, you know. What are we doing to address those difficult situations in probably one of the most difficult terminals to operate because it is so long and so narrow, it has a village on one side and it has a steep rock cliff on the other, and it, it spills out of an eight-lane highway uh, from one of the most densely populated environments in British Columbia. It sounds simple. Um, so what are we doing? Well. We're, this summer, we have tried to shift traffic out of Horseshoe Bay uh, by providing incentives and more capacity on the routes between the Vancouver Island and the Lower Mainland, but through Nanaimo and Tawasson. That has allowed us to bring more vehicles into the holding compound away from the pre-ticket compound and off the highway. Is it the solution that's gonna solve everything? No, but it's a step in the right direction. We have been able to load each ship that leaves Horseshoe Bay with more cars on every ship because we have more time in order to get all those cars through. That helps to address the overload, but that's not enough. In our plans that are in front of the commissioner for final regulatory approval and setting of the price caps, that includes moving to seven day a week supplemental service in the summer times away from five. So addressing the, the decrease in service on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, that's in our plan starting next year. Included in that plan is an incremental vessel that would enable two ship service to be not just a summer thing, but a year round thing. That is a significant increase in capacity for that population served. Uh, and yes, we'll put another quarter in uh, it will require another ship, another 250 to 300 million dollar investment, but it enables two ships year round. I think will significantly uh, address the overloads and the population growth and the uh, stresses on the system that you reference. Um, and then we speak back to Horseshoe Bay. Will all of these things eliminate the need for people to queue in the pre-ticket area where it is an active highway? There are limited amenities as you address. Uh, we do our best to bring in uh, portable equipment, Jiffy Johns, I think you refer to them as. Mm -hmm. uh, we do our best to bring in misting stations, tents, uh, water bottles if those aren't available. But we have to remember this is an active highway 
uh, it makes it dangerous for people to be out milling about. Uh, I recognize that includes the customers, but it also includes employees who are out there trying to deliver water, deliver f services. So the, the, the answer is to address the underlying problem, which is where there's too many vehicles trying to travel in the system. And that's gonna be a major focus of the visioning work that's underway with the province and with the partners, because the solution to solving these problems is not about moving more and more vehicles. It's about moving more and more people in an efficient way and a safe way. And there's gonna be a number of facets of investment that are gonna be required in order to make that a reality. Thank you. Anybody want to add? You would like to add anything to that, or are we good to go? That's all. Thank you very much. Um, with respect to time, we are asking everybody to keep things as brief as they possibly can. Ideally, two minutes for a question or a comment. We have a lot of people waiting. Let's go to Zoom. And uh, Maria Martin, the floor is yours. You have two minutes. Hi, uh, good morning. Um, I'm Maria Martin. I'm the Northern uh, Representative on the BC Ferries Advisory Committee. I live in um, the community of the Hillsuit Nation, Bella Bella. Um, I just wanted to, um, again, address um, that BC Ferries is the primary source of travel for um, majority of the members um, of the remote community of Bella Bella. And when it comes to uh, making reservations and bookings for both um, vehicle and um, room space, um, more often than not, um, the, uh, the travelers are placed on a wait list status. And, and um, I've learned um, also in, in advocacy that, um, you know, there's no um, allotted um, lock offs for um, for residents of the community. So um, in the spirit of collaboration and interest and support to uh, remote and First Nations communities, we would like to request consideration for a block of allocated vehicle and room space on our travel routes. Um, scheduling um, change changes during the summer, as you know, and it's more geared toward accommodating a tourist season. Um, and we have in the fall months, we have the ferry once weekly and then bi on a biweekly uh, every Wednesday. And we would also like to make consideration to keep the biweekly Wednesday sailings in the summer months um, to, to accommodate, um, you know, the travel needs. Um, you know, it's affordable, safe and secure for, for our members who uh, utilize this um, as their primary travel travel uh, arrangement, and the other matter is is the timeliness of complaints being addressed um, <clears throat> to BC Ferries. Um, I had placed the, a complaint uh, two months ago and have had no response. And the nature of the complaint is serious. It's disrespectful and racist. And this complaint was left by an employee of BC Ferries on the administration phone in our tribal council. So I did send follow-up and um, I'm going to keep the pressure on until um, we have some assurance that this employee and the disrespectful and racist treatment um, has been dealt with. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Anyone like to address that? Take a, uh, well, I, I'm gonna say two things. Uh, one, I think I'm going to take away, uh, actually I'll say three things. There are two issues that you raise around booking and specifically uh, an issue that you've had that I think we can we can uh, spend a little bit more time understanding, and I'm looking at my VP of marketing right now. Uh, so we we will follow up post uh, the meeting in order to kind of understand that and and identify uh, the issue a little bit more systematically. Uh, on the issue of the specific complaint that you raise, I understand that there was communication between the company and the nation, but we will we will follow up with you after the call. Uh, in order to um, to sort of double down on that communication. So thank you for raising the issue. Thank you. Good morning, sir. The floor is yours. Good morning. Uh, Eric, 
Neoy. I'm the president of the BC Ferry Marine Workers, representing uh, more than 4,000 unionized members who work uh, on the ferries and in the terminals and at the various uh, locations that BC Ferry has. Uh, Nick was, uh, I noticed changes to ICBC where you, when you were in charge there, uh, specifically my insurance. Uh, I'm just curious if you felt your tenure there uh, had something to do with that. Um, well, the kind of leadership model that I subscribe to is uh, things get done with people, not an individual. Um, so what I bring in terms of personal qualities uh, helps engender change, but it's not me and me alone. So with ICBC, we had fantastic alignment within the company, uh, within government, within our board to get some big things done. I appreciate that and the, the focus on people. I think that aligns well with uh, where BC Ferries was looking to start going last year. Uh, with that in mind, uh, my members, myself, we've seen CEOs come and go. Just looking if there'll be uh, engagement interaction with our membership so we can work together to, to put out what functionally is uh, the floating dumpster version uh, fire of uh, comparing to uh, ICBC. So we'd really like to see uh, collaboration on that uh, moving forward. Uh, with the workforce has been here for decades. I couldn't agree more. I mean, you'll know because you invited me on day four of my first week uh, to attend a session with your with your local presidents. And so that kind of engagement to me is the only way to move forward. Uh, I love the dialogue. I love it real and honest and authentic. And I'll come and chat any time on any day on any issue. So I'm with you. Thank you. Looking forward to it. Thank you. I'll just note that all of the comments made on Zoom have been duly noted. There was one question that came through from uh, Nathan Davidovich questioning the possibility of one of the Gabriel ferries being uh, a foot passenger ferry and the other one staying as a vehicle ferry. Um, I think we'll take that away. Okay. Okay, let's go back to Zoom. Uh, Christopher S. Christopher, please tell us what the S stands for, where you are, and who you are. Thank you. Uh, Chris Sorensen, I'm a former BC Ferries employee and ferry user who wants to see the service continue to improve. Uh, I'm currently in Nanaimo. Um, I have some concerns about retention and recruitment. Uh, I've worked at BC Ferries for nearly six years, and the main reason I left was due to quality of life and compensation concerns uh, over two years ago now. Very glad to hear that there's been some action to address these mm -hmm. concerns. Um, as a long, as a casual worker, um, I was very concerned about, um, you know, having shift sharing options. So, like, if somebody prefers to work mornings and somebody else prefers to work afternoons, having some sort of shift sharing arrangement um, to allow for like a, a more consistent schedule, um, and you know, like an online portal for like swapping shifts and things like that, so somebody can say, hey. I've got this shift that I'm scheduled for. Can somebody else work it? Are those things that are being looked at or, or what other options are on the table there? Um, well, it's, it's a very specific question. What I Maybe I'll kind of take it up a notch to say, and I agree with you, that the, the, the staffing and crewing model that we have today, it's very complicated. Uh, as someone new coming into the organization, uh, I understand that we are a shift work company. I understand that... Um, we run a business that effectively runs 24 hours a day and 365 days a year. So it is inherently complicated. And I think it can also be true that the shift uh, and crewing approach we have today um, should be reevaluated. I don't think uh, there's a, it works for everybody. I know that. Uh, so one of the commitments we've made, and we've been very public uh, about this with our, with our people, uh, but also in the public, is that we need to reevaluate this. Uh, and not just one part of it, but the whole thing, from uh, how we describe people to the roles they have, to how they're trained, the certifications they acquire through their career, to what they're paid. Uh, so all of that, for me, is on the table. And I brought in a new leader to help us engage in that conversation. I don't think it's an overnight fix, but I do think it's work that we're going to chip away at. We already started this summer with a whole bunch of new initiatives, things that were I don't want to say radically different for the company, but they were certainly not things we'd done in the past. And I think that's indicative of the kind of change that you can see coming forward, going forward. And I hope, quite frankly, that you, you take another look at us uh, as your career unfolds, because I think we are the kind of place where you can pursue a career. Uh, and I hope, you, I hope you return. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Oh, I don't know. Good morning. Paula White, Provincial First Vice of the Ferry Workers. 
um, seeing we're on the hiring topic. Um, moving forward, an eye of diversity within the BC Ferries uh, between women's um, hiring as well as um, other gender, well, other uh, equity seeking groups. What have you gone um, or what is your plan moving forward to see um, a more diverse workplace at BC Ferries within the bargaining unit as well as within management ranks? Uh, well, I think you're right to call it out. Um, I think it's no surprise that this is a very male, uh, there are aspects of our business that are very male dominated, very male centric. Uh, some of that extends to the business we're in and the history that follows that industry. So I think we need to systematically look at this issue. And I would agree with you 100%. The fact that we've got 12 or so uh, masters who are women and of the 120 or so in our ranks, I don't think that's acceptable today. Uh, I don't think it's just a question of hiring more masters because, as you know, uh, it takes many, many years to, uh, to certify and train. So we've got to go back to the beginning to say, where are we attracting people into this industry uh, right out of high school? Uh, and as I think about post-secondary and making the choice to say, this is a career, this is a viable career path uh, because I see people like me, you know, in it. Uh, and participating in the programs to get trained. So uh, we will get better in this space, uh, and I look forward to doing the work with, with you and with all the other uh, leaders in the company who, who feel exactly the same way as I do. Thank you. Follow up? No, no follow up. Okay, let's go back to Zoom. Um, Again, we, we're kind of uh, running up against a timeline issue here. Bob Hansen on Zoom. Good Hi morning, there. Bob. The floor is yours. Hi there, thank you very much. I uh, just have a quick note for the, I guess this one would be for the marketing department. I run a lodge and campground on Vancouver Island and I really appreciate you guys doing the extra length vehicle promotion over the years. Um, I have two things I suggest for this promotion. Um, one is it's really hard for my guests to plan their fishing trips and their camping trips in advance when normally it's not announced until the middle of May. Um, and secondarily, uh, it's unfortunate that the promotion is only offered between May and October. Um, I encourage you guys to look into offering this extra length vehicle promotion year round um, to promote tourism with rec recreational vehicles uh, to Vancouver Island. Um, I think it would help our economy greatly to be able to encourage people to bring their boats and their toys and their RVs and their campers year-round to the island. That's it for me. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, let's continue with Zoom. Uh, we have some people stacked up here. Tamina Aziz. Tamina, the floor is yours. Hi there. Uh, yes, Tamina Aziz here with CTV News. Um, so I understand the July long weekend was quite chaotic for travelers. Uh, there were website outages where people weren't able to book tickets online. Uh, BC Ferries also post about non-existing long waits. And so from my understanding, the website predicts wait times and doesn't actually reflect real-time wait times. So how is BC Ferries going to address this issue moving forward? Um, well, you're absolutely right that the way we've built current conditions, it's the best information we have available about what people intend to do in the system in terms of res reservations. So it's doing what it's designed to do, but I think you're calling out uh, the question that could it do more? I think we agree. Uh, so we are looking at whether we can provide more information, more insight to help people make travel choices. Because as you know, with current conditions, it is accurate, uh, but we don't know the intentions of a customer at 10 in the morning, what they plan to do at six at night. Uh, we don't have that data currently, uh, but it is definitely something that we are looking at. I think the summer has put that issue into a spotlight uh, and it's it's, it's clear that we need to reevaluate current conditions. You have a follow up, Tamina? Um, I do. Um, basically, uh, the common theme that I've understood from this meeting here is that a lot of people have issues in regards to timely service and reliable service. There seems to be this public. Um, lack of trust with BC Ferries that has been developed over the span of the last few years or so. Um, how is BC Ferries going to build that trust with the public again? We're going to invest in the system and build a world-class ferry system over time. Uh, I mean, 
you know, there are two things that can be true at the same time. 98.5% of all sailings go out as planned. Uh, eight and a half out of 10 of them go out on time. Uh, if you're not one of those people in those categories, it's obviously very frustrating, but the system is moving a lot of people and generally doing it very reliably. Uh, we've identified that there's a lot of areas where we need to improve, clearly. Investments in aging assets, investment in people, uh, investments in technology. These are all things that we have in a plan. We've been very clear about that plan. We put it forward to our regulator. Uh, we're working with our boards on business cases to advance these, these solutions. Some of them can be done in the near term. Others will take time. Building a vessel is not something that happens overnight. So I agree that we are going to build uh, a system that people can be confident in, and I look forward to doing the work with my team. Great, thank you. Sir, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Andy Ross, uh, Ferry Authority Board. Um, as most people sitting here know, the Ferry Authority uh, looks at the larger scale, longer term uh, issues of the public interest, but we can't hit dabbling a little bit in some of the operational sides. Uh, three years ago, I raised a question in this uh, forum. Uh, a lot of people I knew, including yourself, Nicholas, I knew the chair of the service board and a number of the service uh, board members. And it was to do with the skilling and availability of ticketed skilled mariners. And at that time, we were early in COVID, and I claim no responsibility for raising this. It was a well-established fact there was a worldwide shortage. It's been said a number of times, we are the largest ferry operator in North America. Um, at that time, we were reliant very heavily on importing skilled tickets from elsewhere. Um, we had a shortage of commitment to training within our own or organization. I am heartened at the talks that we've had so far, and I welcome uh, our new VP. Um, but I'd the immediate difficulty of allowing the time for people to upskill, to both attend, and to be able to afford puts pressures on any organization. Uh, our past experience proved this has not been successful and it will cause some crimping. Without asking for a specific response, I would encourage that built into any going forward short-term operational plans, allowances for both the time of the funding, not just the direct payment, but comparison to other ferry operators in our North American jurisdiction. For instance, Marine Atlantic, I just experienced, paid the full cost for training and the retention and are fully operated. Washington State Ferries, I believe, has just brought in $10,000 allowances for training for staff members. I don't know what the answer is. It's not my role on our board, but I would really encourage, uh, as we roll out in the operational plans, that high consideration being given if there is a business case to promote this, but it's also the right thing to do. As one of the largest operators, I think there's a, a moral uh, obligation as well that we give those obligations both to the staff so that we can accomplish our goals. I know you're aware of it, but I just want to make sure that this is stated again. So hopefully, no, I, as we go forward, that we, we are able to supply the kind of skill trades people we need to operate our world-class ferry system at a world-class level. So I'm just stating that again so we consider it. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Through, you, through your board position, you'll be able to carry this conversation forward. So I'm going to take one more question, okay? Absolutely. Great. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Uh, and we're just about out of time, folks. We have time for anybody want to comment on that? Or we're good? Well, I, I mean, other than to say I agree with you, Andy. Um, and it's not just money, it's time. So you need to have staffing levels in order to allow people to go and take that training uh, to come back and move into higher level positions. So we agree with you on all fronts, and that's the work we're doing. Uh, okay, uh, we're going to do one more, uh, and then we have to wrap this up. So uh, Mick Sweetman on Zoom has been waiting for quite some time. Mick, the floor is yours. Yeah, hello, thank you. Um, I guess my question is if, uh, oh, sorry, I'm from CHOI, the campus community radio station in Nanaimo. And uh, my question is on the coastal renaissance. Um, I was just curious if when the last time they had a major overhaul for the that vessel's engines and also if there's any connection between uh, the engine failure on August 17th with the engine problems that took the ship out of service on July 28th. Um, I'm going to have to get back to you with specifics on the last overhaul. Obviously every ship goes through an annual refit uh, and there's a number of things that have to happen. 
uh, and then every five years it goes through a more substantial overhaul. I don't know uh, the schedule. I can look at Kareen, you can give me the number if you know it off the top of your head. No, she doesn't. So we'll get back to you on that. And no, the two issues were unrelated as you just, uh, as you just asked. Yeah, um, my fault is I noticed in the uh, cancellation statistics that in fiscal year 2023, uh, Route 2 between Horseshoe Bay and Departure Bay had roughly doubled the rate of canceled sailings of other major routes. Uh, 127 or about half of those were due to crew issues. Uh, however, in the first quarter of 2024, uh, this fell to two sailings being canceled due to crew issues. Uh, can you just tell us what BC Ferries did to address the crew issues on that route? Um, I can speak more generally uh, what we've done in the system versus just the route because we're actually seeing uh, that improvement um, not just on that route but others as well. So I, I described, uh, one, we hired more people. Uh, two, we uh, eliminated a category of work that wouldn't guarantee people hours and in fact we guaranteed people hours. That really cut down our attrition. Our attrition over the summer is significantly lower than what it has been in previous years which has been significant. Uh, we put in employee referral programs so we we incented people to bring in the people that they know uh, into the company. Uh, we went out and used the reciprocity agreements of the federal government to negotiate with other countries to bring in licensed mariners. Uh, we put in certificate allowances for certain uh, license officer positions, including those people who work overnight in our engineering departments. Um, so these and others, we, we, I think we invested $7 million more in training. So we're doing a lot to make the environment uh, more attractive to work, come and stay. Uh, we have a lot more work to do. I think this summer has proven that small changes can have a big effect, uh, but it's more systematic. And some of what Andy described uh, earlier in his question are the things that we are going to be doing over time. Uh, so stay tuned, there'll be more to talk about. So with apologies to those waiting online, we're not gonna be able to get to your questions or comments. Please feel free to submit them to agm at bcferries.com. That's agm at bcferries.com. And sir, you're welcome to come and speak in person to these folks before they leave the room today. We're gonna to move toward adjournment of the meeting now, and I'm gonna invite uh, Alicia Stewart, the chair of the Board of BC Ferry Authority, for closing remarks. If your mic is on. Can we get her table mic turned on? Oh, all right. Okay. Thank you. First of all, uh, thank you all on, on the phone, uh, and thank you all in the room. Uh, for joining us this morning and for your questions. I'm sorry we didn't have time to get to all of them, but I would encourage you to submit, submit them. And we'll answer them. <laughs> uh, I, I just want to say that our, I think it's, it's an absolute certainty that uh, your respective boards and the executive team uh, really remain steadfast in the commitment to provide high quality service for the people of British Columbia. We're on it and we're doing it. Uh, and we're going to get better at it. Um, I now declare the annual meeting of the BC Ferry Authority and the British Columbia Ferry Services adjourned. Have a good day, everybody.